I have this. There we go. Okay. Great. Okay. I didn't even know how you're doing. How morning. Oh, can you hear me? I can hear you, but you're breaking up. Oh. The video's breaking up. Oh, no. Uh, not good. That means our internet is not good today. Well, if it breaks up too much, then let me know because that's not conducive to chatting with you. Another thing about these uh, developing worlds, the internet. Yeah. Well, what do you think? Do you can you hear me now, or is it too choppy? I can hear you. Yeah, it's just the video is a bit erratic. But okay, and then yeah, if well, I can always turn it off too. And we can just look at you. <laughs> no, 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 we don't want that. Let's keep going. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. If it gets too choppy, just let me know. Um, all right. So, um, okay, so let's start chatting. So, we are going to chat about mental and emotional cultivation um, that is necessary for acupuncturists. Um, and let's start is talking about how necessary that actually is because when i was a you know when i first started i really struggled for the first two years and not really until i involved that mindset component um did, did i start to be successful in my practice you know and and just really had no idea how impactful that was and the awareness I needed for my emotions and for my mindset to really be successful. How are you doing? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. And then, and you know, I was thinking, when you first started in your practice, was it just a whole different ball game then? Like, did you also struggle with those things back when you started in your practice? Which things in particular? Like, were did you need to? Um, did you need to really like cultivate a success mindset and cultivate, you know, an awareness of your emotional reactions to your patients in order to be successful in your practice? Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was thinking that. <laughs> for a couple of reasons. First of all, I mean, I was one of the only acupuncturists around. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so patients came to me. Um, and I did find it emotionally very challenging because, you know, yeah. I, I was launched out to practice, um, desperately undertrained by modern standards. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, there were great gulfs in my knowledge and, but I was kind of naturally, I have been quite a naturally confident, excuse me one moment, mm -hmm. confident person. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I was used to, you know, I'd had a career and just, you know, doing, hey, I do this, hey, I do that. So, yeah, it wasn't that much of a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Today, I mean, it's probably one of the biggest challenges that I see with the acupuncturist that I coach. You know, I mean, and I don't, I, I mean, and, and maybe it is because, you know, it's such a different time. There's so many more acupuncturists. We're dealing with, you know, referrals from other doctors and being in different locations and our patients being more informed about it and have, you know, different questions and all kinds of stuff like this. And it really paralyzes a lot of acupuncturists um, and they just allow it to get to them and their insecurity, you know, get triggered and their self-worth gets triggered and then they're not being... Um, you know, the boss of their treatment room because they haven't cultivated their mindset. They haven't cultivated that awareness with the emotions. Um, and a lot of not only practitioners suffer for this, but also the patients suffer for this too because they're not utilizing the medicine correctly, you know, and then nobody's getting better. Yeah. So I was, you know, I, I know your focus is primarily on practice success. And yeah. therefore, the relationship of um, emotional and mental cultivation in order to generate success, 
I'd also like to take the wider picture, which you've mentioned. I think yeah. so just thinking about it, the kind of two aspects of mental and emotional cultivation for practitioners, the yin and the yang, if you like. Um, the yin is the work on the, on the self for the health and well-being of the practitioner, mm -hmm. which I think could include things like confidence and so on, um, which is a big subject. Um, mm -hmm. And then the, the yang and the, the external thing is the effect of the practitioner's state of mind on the patient, which is something mm -hmm. I've thought, you know, researched and thought about, um, discussed in um, things I've presented online about, for example, about slow, deep breathing, its effect on mm -hmm. the uh, autonomic nervous system, shifting people into, shifting us into deep parasympathetic state, which radiates to the patient. So that's something I would like to talk about in this conversation. Oh, yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So where do we you know? Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> we did try to narrow down our topic, but it's really large. <laughs> well, I mean, let's talk about that. Because I, you know, and I am so with you. You know, when I, um, you know, presented the workshop, too, I talked about uh, a little bit about this, the self-care that's so necessary. And I think meditation, some form of meditation, which, you know, can be deep breathing, is 100% necessary for the self-care of the acupuncturist. Yeah. You know, for many reasons, like the ones you're talking about. Yeah. So, um, okay. So in terms of self-cultivation, <clears throat> you know, which, uh, which is uh, absolutely part of the Chinese tradition of, of broadly of traditional Chinese medicine, it's a particular aspect of it, but it radiates through to everything else. I would say that, um, emotional and mental cultivation is prioritized and uh, for very good reasons that really if we want to take care of ourselves it's kind of the first thing that we have to do to find ways to cultivate men, uh, and, and learn to manage and learn to understand learn to observe our mental and emotional state but that's partly and it also applies to patients because until we have some awareness of ourselves and how we work until we have some kind of level of emotional integration we can't really look after ourselves mm -hmm. so that's universal practitioners and patients you know yeah I'll start going to the gym i'll start running every day i'll start this diet or that diet so many failures because there's this lack of integration in our on the one hand our desire to, to look after ourselves and care for ourselves. On the other hand, something inside us that is working in the opposite direction is yeah. undermining us. And, and that's usually a whole stack of uh, negative messages that we've inherited from our childhood, from parents, from teachers. We don't love ourselves. So the challenge really, I mean, you could almost sum it all up in that simple phrase the challenge is to love ourselves mm -hmm. then we can care for ourselves and we can care for others authentically mm -hmm. and genuinely but although it's simple to say love ourselves it's one of the hardest challenges there is you know, one so of like, the hardest. Mm -hmm. yes and, and for many people who had even people who have not had a terribly challenging childhood there are mm -hmm. all these messages we internalize about not being good enough or clever enough or pretty enough or whatever it is uh -huh. um, and for people who've had a genuinely um really challenging childhood it's it's very very difficult yeah oh yes you are spot on spot on mm -hmm. you know i think loving yourself is also so challenging for people because what does that mean you know i remember I heard this for years, you know, years. I was like, but I do love myself. Like, I don't understand, you know, and not until I understood the concept of fully accepting 
everything that I was and any emotion that like flowed through me and any, you know, maybe like reaction or trigger that I had, not until I understood that concept of full acceptance and to stop judging myself for any way I was being, that was when it made sense to me that's what loving yourself means. You know, so I think that that is a challenge with that. People just don't quite understand what that means. Right. So I agree completely with that. Um, I would say for me, it means um, accepting ourselves fully, mm -hmm. dark and light, mm -hmm. the whole shabbat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that makes it sound a bit simple. The problem is that when we uh, use a method, I mean, I think Vipassana, which I know you practice, I, I've done a lot of meditation. I haven't done long Vipassana trees, but I've done a lot of um, quite deep therapy. Mm -hmm. We have, we, most of us need to use a method like that mm -hmm. in order to illuminate all the corners or all the, the um, unlit yeah. parts of ourselves that we've shut yeah. off because we've deemed them unacceptable to, or challenging. And being able and willing to look at them is a heroic pursuit. It requires a, a hero's mindset because it's difficult. Yes. The things that we, um, you know, I used to think of it often when I was working in therapy is like wounds that had yeah. scabbed over and there was a thick mm -hmm. skin over them and they were tucked away in a box somewhere with a triple lock on, you know. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And only when <laughs> we kind of allow it all, we're not hiding from it. We're not ashamed. So shame is another thing. It's another very oh, good thing, I think. Big. You know, um, when we're not ashamed of... of so, so, I mean, this is... This is, yeah, is this the right tack? <laughs> yeah, because it's quite, it's quite difficult stuff, isn't it? Um, I, think, I think when we have, when, when painful, humiliating, difficult experiences have been sealed off and hidden, mm -hmm. then we have a feeling of shame about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if we feel shame about ourselves, we're not accepting ourselves and we can't love ourselves so really awareness finding a way to penetrate and be aware of the complex you know the complexity of our uh, psyche is, mm -hmm. is the big task but it's not easy so we probably have to look at more management techniques because not everybody has got the time the facility the assistance to take on yeah. that work. yeah Absolutely. You know, and then how specifically too this applies in our practices is that when we do have those wounds that are scabbed over, what happens is that they get triggered in our practices with our patients, but we don't understand that that's happening. And then we think, you know, that we're just a bad practitioner or that, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing or whatever when actually it's just a lot of times our deep inner wounds that are being triggered through the dynamics with the patients and just through the, um, you know, being like a boss of a practice and figuring out how to run a practice and all that stuff, it really triggers a lot of those blind spots of ours. And then also too, our patients are coming into our practice with these things too. And a lot of times this can contribute to someone's illness. And once you start to illuminate yourself and bring awareness to yourself, you're able to understand your patients a lot clearer also and the component that that plays in their illness and in their healing. Yeah. However, um, I do feel that we need to be very clear about limits and boundaries. I mean, if you, if you are a practicing psychotherapist, you know, obviously there are many different forms of psychotherapy, but common to a lot of them is that the biggest thing that is going on in the ther therapeutic session is what's going on inside the therapist, inside the patient or the client, 
and the interaction between the two. So it's almost like you can spend years in therapy just um, relating to what's going on in the room at the moment because it embodies everything. But we're not like that. We're, we're doctors. So we can't, we have to, you know, we have to be, decide what our reasonable limits are. And that's why I say that although um, the kind of stuff we've been talking about, which is kind of deep awareness, deep therapy, maybe an important part of our own personal journey, mm -hmm. um, we have to look at perhaps more realistic, slightly more limited management techniques to help us be better practitioners. Um, and so that's where things like, um, uh, well, I talk about breathing and you talk about meditation, where we cultivate um, presence, full presence. Uh, we learn through stilling the mind to be a bit more aware of how we're reacting. Um, uh, in all kinds of ways. I mean, you mentioned, you know, talk about triggers. I mean, and other things, we're dealing with illness. And sometimes we're dealing, sometimes we, well, you could say almost always on some level we're dealing with death. Yes. I mean, all, all illness up to a point is a, is a, a trigger to think about yeah. mortality. Mm -hmm. And in modern medicine, in Western medicine, one of the, in my opinion, one of the reasons it's it's so bad at managing the dying process mm -hmm. is that most doctors and nurses are just terrified of death. Mm -hmm. So when you're terrified of something, you can't handle it well. So if we have patients coming in, particularly patients with terminal illnesses or potentially terminal illnesses, that can trigger our own unresolved fears of death. And then we become you know, in our own way, unable to deal with that. We're not quite the same as the medical profession, you know, refusing to accept death and just shoving tubes mm -hmm. and medicines inside people, you know, mm -hmm. way past the time that it is appropriate. But, yeah. you know, our own fears of illness and our own fears of mortality are also going to be present in the room. So practicing meditation or something similar, which increases our awareness of what's going on inside ourselves and how we're reacting is important. Um, mm -hmm. And then the, the bit that I was going to, I just want to talk about, and then I'll give you a chance to say, <laughs> I'm yeah. dominant. I'm dominant. Tell me to talk. <laughs> I, I got very, you know, I do, my passion is Qigong. So I've mm -hmm. been practicing for a long time. Qigong mm -hmm. involves, um, meditation, meditational presence. But what I practice also involves slow, deep breathing. And so I became very interested in the research that has been carried out in the last few years uh, about uh, into slow, deep breathing and its effect on the autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. So we know that when we breathe at a certain rate, so about between five and six breaths a minute, particularly if it's lower abdominal breathing, which takes the diaphragm down, then that has a powerful stimulating effect on the vagus nerve. Yeah. And the vagus nerve dominates the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh -huh. so, we, so by slow, deep breathing, we strongly stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. And being in a parasympathetic state is characterized by um, calmness, relaxation, yeah emotional openness, trusting, friendliness, uh, and so on. And a little bit more besides. So uh, one of the pioneers in this field, Stephen Porges, um, talks about how the vagus nerve, which is very, it's the, I think the longest nerve in the body, it goes, connects the brain and most of the organs of the body. It also has branches that go up to the face to the vocal cords into the ears. So yeah. he points out that um, one, of, I'm slightly interpreting what it is, one of the great reasons that Homo sapiens has been so successful 
in taking over the world is, <laughs> is because we have worked out or we've developed a defense system uh, that is more sophisticated than the more animal defense system, which is uh, called the fight or flight, the sympathetic one. So if you look at a lot of wild animals, they're on a state of constant alertness and potential fear. If you look at birds, you know, they won't come and eat in my garden until they're absolutely 100% sure there are no predators or threats around. We can't, we wouldn't have been successful if we had to operate like that. So what we've developed is the ability to send um, messages to each other, unconscious messages that we're all very good at reading, that we are in safe situations. And we do that through how our faces, so mm. we're sending uh, visual messages through our face. So obviously if our face tenses up and tightens, we look at mm. something like that, we know they're dangerous. So we're constantly, 50 people sit in a room at a lecture, we're all constantly giving out these messages to us. This is okay, it's safe. I don't have to constantly look over my shoulder. Mm -hmm. Second way we do it is through our tone of voice. Not just the tone of voice, but the speed, the tempo, the pauses. It's either a reassuring safety voice or it yeah. isn't. And the third way the vagus nerves go to the ears is our ability to listen. So if somebody feels that another person is hearing them, mm -hmm. so the moment a patient um, even telephones us, mm -hmm. we speak to them on the phone, and certainly the moment they walk into the room, we have the potential to be from our parasympathetic state to be sending very powerful messages to them that this is safe, this is mm -hmm. a situation they can trust, and this is something they can relax into. And that helps trigger their parasympathetic state, yes. which makes something completely or, or largely unfamiliar to them in their lives. Yes. A lot of people are locked into almost a permanent sympathetic, oh. fearful, untrusting state. So immediately, yeah. just the impact of our encounter can already, before we do any needles, before, even before we, barely before we talk to them, can already powerfully initiate the healing process. Yep. It can't be faked. <laughs> because we wouldn't, human sapiens wouldn't have got where we are if we weren't really smart at picking up these clues. So you can put on mm -hmm. the most caring tone of voice. You know, oh, are you? Oh, are you? <laughs> oh, you know, and you can play the role. Yeah. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't come from that deep state. So for so my my summary of that, and I'll hand over to you, is for our own <laughs> um, mental and emotional health mm -hmm. and for um, the benefit that that can give to patients and make them induce in them feelings of trust and comfort in being with us, we have to promote our own parasympathetic state, which can mm -hmm. be by basically done. There's only a few ways, really, meditation and breathing. And meditation also, and yeah. an acupuncture. Also acupuncture, you know, that can yeah. help also. It can do, absolutely. However, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I think if, yeah, no, it, uh, it absolutely can. Um, it may not be enough. That's why I think, personally, think mm -hmm. all practitioners should um, teach patients slow, deep breathing. Because mm -hmm. we can only give acupuncture for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Once in yep. a while, they can practice yep. slow, deep breathing. Patients can go home and practice it every day. So. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you wrote an article on that just like a year ago, right? It was did, like that yeah. Ago. Yeah. yeah. It's freely available you know, online, Journal of Chinese Medicine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Act of slow deep breathing. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It was a great article. Um, I also just want to make it be clear for, for the acupuncturists that watch and you know and 
let me know if you align with this, is that when, when, you, when you do this work, um, you know, with the tone of your voice and, and calming your own nervous system so that you create trust with your patients, that's going to look and sound and feel different for each person, um, you know, for each practitioner. So I just want to make it clear for the acupuncturist that it's not like you're trying to get to this, like, monk meditation state. You know, that's not your natural state and not naturally who you are. You're just working to calm your own personal nervous system so that you are in your authentic state, not like a, a mold that you're trying to fit because everybody's different authentic state will calm different types of patients. Absolutely. So if, as the word authentic is absolutely key because as I said, we can't fake it. So for, yeah. you know, I, I have got a, a really dear friend who's a wonderful practitioner and I used to work next door to him. All I'd ever hear coming from his room was laughter. I mean, I mean, <laughs> patients just used to laugh. I like them. <laughs> all day long. You know, that was his way. Um, so, yes, authenticity. And authenticity may actually, funnily enough, may not always be nice. You know? Yes, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but sometimes. You still connect with a certain type of patient and they will um, experience trust from that. Yes. So the more, so when we talk about practitioner cultiv cultivation, this is really, I mean, this is really um, a key point. What, what we understand in medicine, but particularly in Chinese medicine, is that there's almost nothing as precious as experience. We, um, we constantly grow as practitioners because we build up an information database about human beings. Mm -hmm. We learn, yeah. you know, and we recognize people more and more because we've got more and more data to go on. We've seen yep. eventually thousands of patients. We understand this situation, we understand that, we understand these diseases better, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and in terms of treatment, whether it's selection of needles or strength of treatment or selection of herbs, we get better and better at responding appropriately, okay. giving that patient their appropriate treatment. And it's the same with communication. We, the more centered we are and the more data we have, the more able we are to respond appropriately to people. And some people need tender loving care. Mm -hmm. Some people need a tough approach. <laughs> no. yep. Some people yep. need to be told some home truths and you need to know whether this is a patient who can accept them or not. So, yeah. I mean, that's a bit of a crude example. I mean, it's more subtle, it's more subtle than yeah. that. But <laughs> we are constantly improving our ability to respond more appropriately in a way that is more suitable to help that mm -hmm. particular person. Yep. If, if we work on silencing our mental chatter, that can get in between us and our ability to read that patient. You know, which goes back again to having to self-cultivate. Absolutely. And increase our awareness because in all kinds of ways, patients can um, trigger unconscious reactions in ourselves. Yep. Whether it's they remind us of our mother or father or, yep. <laughs> you know. Or yes. Mother. I have had patients that remind me of my mom. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I love uh, you, mom. <laughs> There's one other, just that brings me to one other thing, one other discovery I made mm -hmm. in myself, I think as a result of doing therapy actually, is there's this mm -hmm. really interesting pattern in Chinese medicine called gallbladder chi deficiency. Um, somehow it's not taught, maybe not taught so well. Sometimes it's called deficiency of the gallbladder and heart. Sometimes I feel like that would make an indecisive person. That's what comes to the yeah. top of my head when you say that. Right. So... My observation is it's a really important pattern and it manifests in two ways. One of them is PTSD, mm -hmm. post shock syndrome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, oft, often more in adult patients who have 
uh, mm -hmm. shocking experience and then mm -hmm. they become very fe fearful and scared and timid and can't mm -hmm. relate to people and want to stay inside the house because that's one of the signs people don't want to one of the signs of the pattern they don't want to go out yeah. and communicate yeah. and because that usually happens in adults and and it's kind of fresh in a way it's a fresh insult i think the general consensus is that is that is treatable one way or another people mm -hmm. can help through that oh yeah much deeper seated and much more insidious and much harder to change is when it happens in childhood and it happens through repression mm -hmm. a child is constantly humiliated um mm -hmm used, diminished, mocked, mm -hmm. when their sense of self, their liver chi, their gallbladder chi is never allowed to express itself, is always stamped on and repressed, mm -hmm. then they never, their, their wood never grows. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Their gallbladder yeah. chi and their liver chi never grows, can never express itself. And it becomes um, almost destroyed. So these, yeah. when people suffer from this to varying degrees, Yes, yes, they're indecisive. Yes, they're fearful. Um, mm -hmm. They can never get in touch with anger. Mm. It's not like the liver chi stagnant patient who's all pent up with anger and can't express it, but the right trigger will make it burst out. These people cannot mm -hmm. even feel anger. Yeah, so, like numbed out almost. Yeah, so what happens often is in their presence we feel angry we feel we uh, respond by feeling the anger that they don't feel so I'm, I'm sure we've all had experience of patients who have a very sad and very pitiful story to tell mm -hmm. somehow when they're telling it we start to feel very irritated mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So i you know when i encountered this the first few times, I just thought it's just because I'm a, bad, a nasty person, you know, this person's <laughs> telling me a tale of woe, and I'm just thinking, you know, I don't like you, and you make me feel angry, and, you know, I'd like, I'd like you to go away, kind of thing. Yeah. Until I eventually realized that this was just a, yes. a response yes. to yeah. this, this pattern. Yeah. Um, I love this point because... Um, that it took me, man, it probably took me about five years to realize that a lot of the emotions I was experiencing, I was picking up from my patients. Right. And they weren't internally from me, but it was actually superficial, like from my patients. And I would have a lot of experiences like that, you know, and not just anger, but all, all different kinds of emotions. You know, and, and this is so important for practitioners to understand because, okay, there's two parts. Because the first part is I think that this is a huge part of what contributes to so many acupuncturists feeling burnt out um, is them not understanding that they're picking up a lot of their patients' emotions and taking it on as their own and having no method like the breathing or the meditation to clear it out. Um, and then the other thing, going full circle, that we were talking about um, Western doctors. Western doctors also deal with this stuff, um, but like you said, they often will, you know, stifle it, shove it down. And in the U.S., you know that Western doctors, out of all professions, have the highest rate of suicide. Yeah. And I think that a lot of it has to do with this. And one of the things that I really encourage acupuncturists to do, um, because, you know, we're also doctors. We're dealing with these same energetic exchanges that Western doctors are. But one of the, one of the things I encourage so much is to keep your heart open. You know, when these things happen um, and and by keeping your heart open, I mean, you know, be very be present to the emotions. Don't shove them down, you know, like be present to how you're feeling with that patient in front of you. Um, and and yes. And I lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, OK, in that case, I'm going to jump in. And so you yes. talked about an open heart. And. 
so much so much of managing life is 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 finding the balance between opposites harmonizing opposites harmonizing yin and yang so um yeah. i understand and agree about the open heart but i'd also say on the contrary also you know the, the opposite of that is i think it's really important not to um not to get too emotionally involved with patients yeah. and by yes. that i mean i mean I mean, different things. So, for example, I think a common experience, certainly an experience I had, and I'm pretty sure it's common at the beginning until we get experience, and for some people may carry on right through their practice, is the moment they take on a patient, they kind of fall into this godlike, uh, egotistic idea yeah. that kind of almost everything that happens to the patient is yeah. their responsibility. Yes, totally. You, know, you treat the patient and the patient comes back next week and you say, how are you this week? And they go, oh, it's much worse. You know, yeah. I felt much worse this week. And you allow that all to fall on your shoulders. Yeah. You know, yeah. Either I failed or it's something yeah. I did without recognizing, without recognizing the obvious that acupuncture is, however wonderful it is, it's only one small input yeah. into the... <laughs> three days, five days, seven days of a patient's life, but loads of other stuff's been going on. So yeah. um, we actually have to, to a certain extent, stand back. Yeah. We care for the patient. We do our best. Yeah. We stand back and let what happens, happens. Yeah. It's not our fault. It's not our responsibility. Well, yeah. there may be. Yeah. Yeah. To some degree, it is our fault. Yeah. In some circumstances. <laughs> but generally speaking, we have to detach from it yeah. and that we pay a price for that actually or it's not it's a deal what it means is that we can't exult in wonderful results we can't you know yeah. the patient comes back next week goes wow you're fantastic yeah. I just no. felt, you know <laughs> you know and you go oh, i'm the i'm the business you know I, <laughs> I'm the man, I'm the woman. Um, if you do that, you have to accept the opposite. You have to accept that when a patient comes in and says, I, you know, I've never felt worse. Yeah. You feel absolutely awful. Yeah. No, just just stand back. Yeah. You're feeling better? Yeah. Great. You're feeling worse? I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. 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 That's really important for yeah. self self protection. Hundred percent. And 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 again, let's let's be clear that that doesn't mean numbing out you know no. but again that goes back to what we we're first talking about it means having emotional awareness it means being able to observe yourself and how you're feeling but not reacting to it in that moment you know because we want the opposite of numbing out like we said we want to keep our hearts open but yeah that doesn't mean as an overly emotional attachment to the patient but you just want to allow yourself to have those emotional experiences without it meaning anything yeah and something comes to mind i can't quite put my finger on it um if we can accept our own pain and our own conflicts and so on we can it's easier to accept them in a patient without getting too dragged in mm -hmm. it's the difference between I could just take one action as a symbol of the difference. So um, I had the experience, I'm sure many acupuncturists have had it, that once in a while, a needle would trigger a really powerful emotional reaction in a patient. Oh, and yeah. They start weeping, for example. Yeah, yeah. I noticed, actually, it very often happened when the needle, that particular needle was painful. Mm -hmm. But it would trigger something. There was a big flood of emotional reaction and tears. And in my um, ignorant state <laughs> in the early days, you know, my immediate reaction was to take the needle out, give them a tissue. Yeah. You know, oh, dear. Oh, dear. You know, wipe your eyes. Please stop crying. Sorry. Yeah. Whatever it was. <laughs> okay. So after doing therapy for a while, I go, okay this is interesting you know mm -hmm. what's happening 
tell me what's happening, tell me. And nearly mm -hmm. always, if you allow them that space yeah. to talk about what was happening to them, it was very, very illuminating for them. And yeah. for um, but I could only do that when I wasn't afraid of tears. Yeah. I wasn't afraid of my own tears. I yeah. wasn't afraid of pain and discomfort, you know, yeah. physical or emotional. I understood better. We accept this as part of life. So I can I can better be your friend. Yeah. Moment. Yeah. If I'm dispassionate in that way. It's yeah. not, not lack of empathy or compassion, but it's I'm not sucked into it and I'm not afraid of it. So that that was a big piece of learning for me. Yeah, yeah, that, I mean, that's amazing because, and you know, like that is not taking something personally, which allows you to hold a sacred, safe healing space for the patient, exactly. you know, and when we take things personally, we block that healing, you know, we block the patients being able to release in a safe space, which is super healing for them. And a lot of people don't have anywhere else to release like that. Yeah, and discover. I mean, because something just coming to mind, a particular example. I had a, I remember a woman came to me. Um, she was a professional masseur, masseurs, masseur. She used to go around offices and massage people whilst they sat at their desks, you know, slightly weird. But anyway, and she developed, she developed um, very severe shoulder and muscular pain and neck pain mm. which threatened her um, ability to carry on her work mm -hmm. and so she had employed an assistant to take on some of the work mm -hmm. anyway she came to see me and there was second or third treatment I put a needle in somewhere here mm -hmm. and she just went into complete meltdown mm -hmm. because I was able to stay with it and say what was, you know, what's happening. Yep. It all poured out of her that um, she'd employed this assistant at a, a certain stage and she started hearing from her clients, whether she was hearing it correctly or not, that they preferred the mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. And that was exactly what used to happen with her sister sister was the favorite one and she was you know oh, and, yep. and this kind of all this stuff poured out so mm. it had been repressed mm. and it was probably something she was very ashamed of yeah mm -hmm. shameful feelings yeah you know, jealousy anger all this yep. kind of stuff but we can't deal with our feelings as humans unless we know that they're there yes exactly but, it's, yeah. I don't see it as, as catharsis, release. I yes. see it as discovery. Mm. Discovery yes. and allowing ourselves, it's allowing ourselves to experience what is that allows us to change. Yes. That change happens. Yes. And yeah. that the, the most important component, do not judge it, you know, which is what a lot of us do, you know, is to judge our, our experiences and our emotions flowing through us, which then you know, just makes it worse. <laughs> and we get stuck in those cycles, you know. And we find our patients in the same way. Yes. In fact, Bob yeah. Dylan, who, one of my great heroes, Bob Dylan, who, you know, like a lot of creative people, quite exceptional words of wisdom poured out of him at a very young age. I don't think he even always knew how profound they were, but one that had meaning for me was, um, if you want to heal the sick, First, you must forgive them, mm. so, um, which I think keys into this, not not judging them in their lives, not judging them in their emotions. And that comes from judging, we judge ourselves. Yes, exactly. Yeah. In our lives and emotions. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it goes back again to just like having the practice of being able to observe yourself. You know, observe your thoughts, observe what you're thinking about yourself, observe what you're thinking about, you know, other people, because we're constantly thinking things. Yes. You know what? I wanted to ask you, too, because you were talking about the deep breathing. So it is quite a fad these days to do breath work, but it's not slow, deep breathing. It's almost like hyperventilating-ish type breathing. 
And yeah. I've tried it a couple times. And, I, you know, there's just something in my intuition that tells me that it's not safe. <laughs> it's not good for people. And I hear about these, a lot of people are doing it these days. So I wonder from your understanding of the breath, what do you think about that type of breath work? I mean, I don't, I don't have very clear opinions about it. I mean, fundamentally, fast breathing stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, the kind of mm -hmm. keyed up, you know, action, yeah. threat, danger, you know, um, and slow breathing stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. Yeah. Absolutely. With, even within, because it's a perfect example of the relativity of yin and yang, even within slow breathing or within all breathing, breathing in more stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, breathing out more stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. and that explains why one can, why people, for example, who sing or who play musical instruments, who, who take much shorter in breaths and much longer out breath mm. resistance shift into really lovely parasympathetic states. One of the reasons yeah. people love joining choirs and they find it so good for their mental state, but it can be achieved in other ways. This this rapid breathing, which they do do in yoga, some yoga styles. Oh, you're right. They do it in yoga too, yeah. And this Wim Hof. Yeah, style. Wim Hof, yeah. You know, I don't know, I don't know what to say. I, yeah, I don't I have enough information. Yeah, I know. I mean, it, I, I don't know. I think it's very interesting. I think that um, I think that for what we're talking about, you know, for the for the the cultivation and, and calming the nervous system, I, I think that personally, um, that's not quite the right practice. Only because I mean, one of the reasons too is because I feel like when you're doing it so rapidly, it's such a external thing that you're doing where really going inward more i think is more effective for the type of cultivation that we're talking about yeah just some I, yeah no yeah absolutely i mean it's something i'd really like to um study more about mm -hmm. that fast breathing you know what what what, it, what its benefits and risks are i mm -hmm. think um just one thing i'd like to say is we, you know, we're talking about the emotional or the cultivation of the practitioner. Mm -hmm. and we've gone quite deep, really, mm -hmm. I think, you know, quite deep issues. So to, to sort of come back a little bit out of it, we have to look after ourselves because yeah. um, all, all humans basically need to look after themselves if we want to be well and healthy. Um, we're self-employed. Yep. We, we don't have a, a, a backup if we're sick and we're yep. ill. That's, yep. that's threatening. We are often spending all day, depending how you practice, but spending all day in a room with people who may often be very unhappy yep. or sick. Yep. Constantly reminded that the human body can, or many thousands of ways the human body break down go wrong as somebody joked once so many diseases but only one health it's unfair yeah you know? yep. <laughs> um, so for all kinds of reasons we do need to look after ourselves yeah and we've talked about the um you know emotional and psychological self um, cultivation through meditation and such like but more broadly than that we have to look after the body mm -hmm. you know so let's not forget we need to exercise appropriately and we need to eat well and that's kind of it's kind of part of the job really because 100% we, agree yes. we have to be model apart from anything else we have to be models you can't um try to help help your patients towards health if you're the you're the kind of person who never moves your body, yes, you, know, you have a so important. you have a, a a weak, lazy, sluggish, maybe overweight patient. How are you going to how are you going to communicate to them how much they can help themselves by 
some form of body work and movement if you're a mirror image of them if you yeah. like. I don't, I don't want to be judgmental but i mean fortunately or unfortunately it is a bit of a burden the image of the chinese medicine doctor were offered from history going back to the yellow empress classic is the sage the realized person you know yeah. we, we have a model of a doctor who's not just an ordinary yeah. person like a gp like a general medical practitioner might be who kind of does his work and then goes out and drinks a lot and engages in all kinds of you know unhealthy behaviors yeah. and eats bad and, pharmaceuticals <laughs> yeah whatever you know um we have a doc we we are you know been taught somewhere along the line this model that we are the superior doctor or we we aim aspire to be the superior doctor that can be a bit of a burden to have to live up to we can but we can choose if we like we can choose to go right i take i'll take that on mm -hmm. because i want to be as healthy as i can be for yep. myself for my family for my financial security yep and for my patients yep so you could look at it as a blessing rather than a burden <laughs> yeah, well, it can be it can be both, can't it? Yeah. Yeah. And that can be a source of shame as well, of course. If we're, yeah. you know, if we're unable to control our drinking, for example, or you know, I used to smoke. Mm. Dreadfully mm -hmm. mm -hmm. dread addicted to nicotine for many, many years, you know, and I was practicing when I was and I'd have patients come to me who want to give up smoking. Mm. I used to feel shame about that. Yeah. It took me until I was in my 50s to finally wow. get off smoking. So, wow. You know, yeah. yeah, one thing I dealt with in practice, and, and I help, and a lot of acupuncturists do now that I coach them, I know other people do too, is a shame around uh, having a sick day. Because, you know, I used to think that I was like, I was a healthcare practitioner. So like, I wasn't supposed to get sick, you know, and I would have a lot of shame around that when I was sick. And, I, and again, I'd be judging myself so much. And a lot of acupuncturists experience that mindset. Also, I know now that I coach them um, and they'll like, you know, push through those sick days instead of take a day off from the office, you know, and. Yeah. And you've done that so well, you're now on your third sick year aren't you <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> sorry it's okay <laughs> no now i'm full-time coaching <laughs> I know. I know. so i don't know how long people are going to be we've done nearly an hour I yeah we've done nearly an hour <laughs> we're good no this is an excellent conversation very interesting and i want to remember now let's promote your forest you trust you know I want the acupuncturists to know that you started the incredible Chinese Medicine Forestry Trust, which is that the website too? Chinese Medicine Forestry Trust.com. Yeah. Yeah. Com. So, so just say a few words about it. Um, we all know that I, we should know that the world is in crisis. Yeah. The globe is in crisis, the planet. And we really have a very short window of time to, to try and prevent the worst of what's happening. We can see around the world now, Australia's on fire, the Amazon yeah. has been on fire, yeah. the, the far north's on fire, reports come in daily, the seas are heating up much more rapidly than even climate scientists predicted. This is an absolutely critical situation. Yeah. So, um, there are a number of responses to that. I mean, denial is a big one. You know, lots of people deny it, including the President of the United States and, and, and many other leaders just uh, refuse to accept it. Um, and we might all individually deny it because of fear, mm -hmm. and because actually humans are not very good at dealing with longer term threats. We, you know, mm -hmm. somebody burst into the room now with a hammer I, I'd respond instantly. Somebody tells me that in 10 years' time, you know, things are going to get really bad. We're not really designed very well to, to respond. No. Yeah. Um, and another reason that we can 
fail to respond appropriately, we feel paralyzed. But, you know, we don't know what to do. You mm. know, should I just stop buying things in plastic bags or mm. should I stop driving a car? Yeah. I mean, there are many yeah. things. So sometimes we can end up doing nothing. Yeah. But I felt that. I felt every day hearing this news. I've always loved trees um, and forests. I know that in the absence of any viable technological solution, which has not yet been found, mm -hmm. the single simplest way to start absorbing excess carbon from the atmosphere and to support biodiversity and support wildlife mm -hmm. is to plant trees. Yep. You know, each single tree absorbs many tons of carbon. It's home to hundreds of thousands of species from bacteria to insects to birds. Um, it anchors soil, it absorbs water to prevent flooding. And miraculously, when human beings look at and smell and walk amidst trees, it has this very powerful effect on our physiology. It's incredible. Yeah. You know, reduces cortisol, mm -hmm. uh, encourages, um, sorry, I've forgotten the name. Happy it relaxes life. us, yeah, relaxes us and so on. Uh, oh, serotonin is that what it is? Sorry, serotonin, serotonin, yeah. yeah. So, um, I'd say that was what I was gonna start trying to do. So, with some friends, we set up the Chinese Medicine Forestry Trust, mm -hmm. and the idea is that you know, we, we all feel that as Chinese medicine practitioners, we practice a medicine that's really rooted in the natural world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's such a China. striking point. Yeah, so we have a we have a special responsibility as medical people, medical medical professions always led the way in social and community health. Mm -hmm. We have a double responsibility as Chinese medicine practitioners, with our love and respect for nature. So this is what we've been trying to do is say: like, this is our charity. This is yeah. the Chinese medicine's global charity. We invite everybody, give us your money. <laughs> really simple. <laughs> that. Donate, donate, please donate. Yeah. But so I set up, you know, monthly donations, you know, and then it's 10 pounds a month that goes to it and, and we're planting trees, yeah. you know. And we put all the money, every single penny goes into three worldwide tree planting charities. So mm -hmm. they plant all over the world in developed countries, in developing countries, and so on. So, mm -hmm. That's that's the call out. Do you know? I love it. Let's yeah. respond. Yeah. So Chinese Medicine Forestry Trust and I'll exactly. put it on the post when I post this. Thank too. You. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I love it. And then um, most people know, but to to let everybody know too, I have a new course coming out, um, all about what we've been talking about, you know, and really teaching the emotional intelligence tools to help the practitioners with all these triggers and all of this emotional blind spots that get in the way, you know, from us being able to be successful and from us really being able to service our patients, you know, and so that is coming out, should be next week. <laughs> I've been working on it hard, but I'm super excited to get that course out because we've never had anything like this in our profession. and. I've taken everything that you know I've learned and really applied it specifically to acupuncturists. So it has like a really special little twist on it. Um, and I'm excited for that. So you know that I, you know, I've observed your work and yeah. it's fed on people. Yeah. Really superior ways of dealing with this big issue, the elephant in the room, mm -hmm. right? Of lack of success practitioners. Yeah. So much better and so much more sensitively and deeply than anybody else. You know, most other people focus on how to improve your web presence or, yeah. you know, there, yeah, may or may not be important. People and allows us to, you know, really forward our medicine because we are just getting in our way all the time, yeah. you know, all that the allows time. allows us to improve our income. Exactly, yes. And improved income allows people to for example, subscribe to the Journal of Chinese Medicine and yes, donate, the donate to the Chinese Medicine Variety. So it's, 
absolute win-win. But that's exactly it, though. You know, like money allows us to contribute to the things that matter to us. You know, and I really want to talk more about money too publicly with the acupuncturists because there is nothing wrong with it. Basically, everything that we do, everything that brings you joy in life, requires money. Oh no. Not everything, but... <laughs> Not everything that brings you joy in life. <laughs> Alyssa. <laughs> Not now. everything. Yeah. <laughs> no, but everything... <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Money can't buy everything you want. <laughs> Famous but story. there's nothing wrong with having the money. <laughs> Great, now I just, like, ruined my reputation. <laughs> <laughs> but it does help. I mean, just today in the newspaper in britain those who are wealthy live 10 years longer and have 10 years more healthy life than those who are poor in fact poverty is one of the biggest single causes of disease yeah that makes sense you know and something too that i've been um researching and looking into too is beyond just making money but creating wealth um, and really understanding and learning how to invest your money properly. Um, and that's something that I want to start to teach a bit also because I want to work on like, let's just, let's just end the poverty for acupuncturists forever. You know, like let's wisely utilize the money that we're making also. And when you say invest properly, I would add invest ethically. Yes. Well, something else, if we want to respond to the world's challenges, if we have money, if we have it in a bank savings account or any other account, have a look where your money's going. Yeah. You know, you may be trying really hard to be a good person and act well, and you've got your money sitting in a bank that's doing some really investing it in some things that you really, really don't approve of. And you, you know, we I have know. To yeah. We have, we have in the UK, we've got a couple of ethical banks. Oh, we, interesting. Yeah, because right. I don't know if we have that in the United States. <laughs> must have. I'm going to have to look into that. <laughs> and ethical pension funds and so on. They don't invest in armaments. They don't invest in uh, farm. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, I know in the States, or I'm not sure if people worldwide can invest in it, but yeah, there is an index fund that has like some of the top businesses in it, but I haven't looked to see which businesses those are yet, you know, and I wonder if it is um, like pharmaceuticals and stuff that'd be interesting. And that, I mean, man, that's that's a whole nother conflicting, confusing layer to wealth building, you know? Yeah. Man. Oh, super important because, you know. Yeah. 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 We know why. <laughs> okay. Don't Thank be a dick. You. So, <laughs> don't be a dick. No, don't be a dick. <laughs> Let's end the talk on that note. <laughs> on that <laughs> golden nugget. <laughs> Simple principles for life. Yeah. <sighs> All right. Another wonderful, fascinating chat with you. Thank you so much, Peter, for being here and sharing and sharing all of your knowledge and experience with all of us. And you too. Thank you. Bye. All right. I will see you soon. Bye. Bye.